Hi. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to start by thanking the organizers for bringing us all together. It's been a very fun workshop. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is a part of a book I'm working on uh, called Bit by Bit, Social Research for the Digital Age. And I think of the book as being for social scientists that want to do more data science and data scientists that want to do more social science. So I see these as two very interesting and exciting communities that are not really in as much contact with each other as they could be and should be. Uh, and I think this is a goal that many of us in the room share. Another way to think about what I'm trying to do, and I think what many of us are trying to do, is to push this intellectual movement through the hype cycle. So when, uh, this is, when a new technology is introduced, this is a sort of empirical pattern that often occurs. This is from some research by uh, Gardner, which is a consulting company. So the x-axis here is time. The y-axis, I think, could be called excitement. Initially, something happens. Everyone gets very excited, and they say, oh, big data is going to solve every problem in the world. Then people realize, actually, it's not everything that people claim, and they move into this trough of disillusionment. And then eventually, over time, people realize, no, actually, this is pretty good. This has real serious implications. They weren't quite as good as we thought at the beginning, but they definitely weren't as bad as we thought in the middle. And so I think different people in the computational social science community are at different stages along this curve. And so one of the things I think I want to try to do with my book is to push down this peak of inflated expectations, pull up the trough, and then get to here as quickly as possible. And so implicit in this framing is definitely an argument that this is a real thing. Like, I think in the end, there is this plateau of productivity here where this becomes a normal part of the way we advance social science. So the book has seven chapters. And rather than organizing them around specific data sources, like here's how to do it with Twitter and here's how to do it with Facebook, uh, I tried to organize it in a different way because my expectation is that a lot of the data sources that exist today will not be here five years from now or 10 years from now. So when I started doing this kind of research, everyone was super excited about virtual worlds, so like uh, Second Life. Some of you may remember Second Life. That was a big thing. Not here anymore. So we need a more timeless way to think about how to organize this research. And so I think there are really four main research designs. There's observed data. There's data where you basically just watch people's behavior. This is most of the data that people are using now. There's asking people questions. There's manipulating their environment to run experiments. And then there's actually actively collaborating with them. So this is like crowdsourcing and citizen science. And so generally, most of the research is of this type now. But I argue in the book that as we move down this, as we have more interaction with the participants and more control over their environment, we can actually learn much, much more. Uh, then there's a chapter about ethics and a chapter about the future. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is the survey part of this. So this may seem initially like the least interesting part of the book, because generally people aren't excited about surveys. But I'm going to try to convince you that this is not in any way the least interesting part. OK, so one question that you might have is, well, why should I care about surveys in the digital age? So let me even actually take a step back. Why should I care about surveys at all? Um, so I'm a sociologist, and most of what we know in sociology and quantitative sociology comes through surveys. And I would say it's a similar statement about political science and maybe some of the other social sciences as well. So this is a fundamental part of how we learn about the world, and it's a part that no one really likes. So survey researchers are not very satisfied with the properties of surveys, and participants are definitely not satisfied with the experience of being in a survey. And I, all of you have been in surveys, and I would guess most of you hated the experience. So we have this really kind of fundamental measurement technology that powers a lot of what we do, and it could be a lot better. Let's say it like that. Um, so then to extend the question, why should we care about it in the digital age? So some people are saying, oh, we have all this automatically collected data. We're going to not need to ask people questions anymore. And I think that's just fundamentally wrong. And so 
when I see a lot of this, a lot of the data people are using is what some people call digital exhaust. It's like leftover stuff that people throw off during the course of their daily life. And when I look at that, what I see is a bunch of like debris. So some people think of this stuff, they use a metaphor of like, oh, it's like a microscope or it's like a telescope. I think it's just like leftover garbage. Um, so this is, <laughs> this is uh, obviously it's an aesthetic taste some, but I'm going to argue a little more seriously about why I think this is true. Um, so all this data on Twitter, it's big and shiny and new, but it has a lot of the same characteristics as stuff you find in an archaeological site. So you need to think about why is some data preserved and not other data. Uh, and you need to think about even given an infinite number of pottery shards, actually taking those and then making inference to what is happening in a complex society is a whole nother step of inference that is very challenging. So now I'm going to make this a little more specific. Why I think we will always need to ask, even in the age of digital exhaust. Um, so I'm not saying that we will continue to ask in the same ways we have in the past. How we will ask will change, but we will always need to ask. So first is the inherent limitations of digital exhaust. So one way that I uh, sort of think about this, when I was in high school, there was this company called FUBU that made clothes. It's called For Us, By Us. And digital exhaust is not for us and not by us. And so here I'm thinking of researchers. So the ways companies collect their data is in the service of those companies. It's not, and it turns out that that's not usually the kinds of things researchers are interested in. So for example, my cell phone company can say what percentage of their calls every day are between people whose credit card number ends in nine. If that's something they have data to do. They cannot say what percentage of phone calls are between people of a different race or different level of education. A lot of things that as a sociologist I would be really interested in. They potentially have the capability of giving us this real-time measure of social segregation, but they're never going to do that because they don't want to know, I, I would guess they don't want to know their customer's race and education and social class and so on. They definitely want to know their credit card number. So I think fundamentally there are limits to how we can repurpose this data that was not created for research. It was created for helping these companies do whatever they're doing. Sometimes we can repurpose it. We've seen actually a lot of clever examples of this today. But I think fundamentally that's limited. Um, also, even given an infinite amount of data about people's behavior, it's harder to learn about internal states. So, you know, uh, sociologists sometimes make a distinction between these two. We can know everything that you're doing, and it's hard to know things that are happening inside of your head, like your attitudes and the knowledge that you have and your emotions and so on. So, for example, you know, an example that we frequently ask in surveys is something like, do you approve of how President Obama is doing? So that's an internal state. And the best way to estimate that internal state is often to ask people. Uh, and then finally, there's an inaccessibility of this digital exhaust. And this is a problem that I think people are um, not as sensitive to as they could be. So even if the, all the digital exhaust in the world exists, if researchers don't have access to it, it doesn't really matter. And I think there are fundamental limitations to how much this digital exhaust can be shared. So I, worked for a while at Microsoft, and I didn't really appreciate this until I worked there. It's like, not that these companies are bad and don't want to share their data with research. It's like they're real legal and business barriers to actually this data leaving these companies. So imagine if there's a data leak at, let's say, Facebook. That is really like an existential threat to their business, right? Because if people don't trust Facebook with their data, they're going to stop putting data into it. The ads are going to do worse, and so on. So like, there are real fundamental limitations to researcher access to this data. So I think for these kinds of reasons, we're always going to need to ask people. How we ask is going to change, but we're always going to need to ask some. Um, so sometimes people think of surveys and like that you know, digital exhaust is going to replace surveys, that they're sort of substitutes for each other. But actually, I really think of them much more as complements. So just like peanut butter and jelly are much better together, I think surveys and digital exhaust actually work really, really well together because they have different strengths and weaknesses. And so as there is more and more digital exhaust, 
I think there's going to be increasing demand for more and more surveys if we can figure out how to do them appropriately in the new environment. OK, so now uh, I want to get back to sort of the title of the talk, which is about the third era of survey research, which is, I think, a potentially big and important orienting problem. We've talked a lot about problem-driven research, so here's my explanation for what a good problem is. Uh, but to understand it, we have to understand a little bit more about the history of survey research. So surveys as we know them today sort of originated around 1930. And during the first era of survey research, which was around, sort of ends around the 60s and 70s, sampling was done with area probability sampling, and interviews were done face to face. So basically, people would sample different neighborhoods, and they would send interviewers into those neighborhoods to go and interview people. And then in the 60s, in developed countries, people said, hey, there's a lot of landline telephones. Like, that would be great if we could do surveys over the telephone. So there's this big technical, technological change in the world. And then researchers created this second era of survey research. So this is the, research, the era that we're somewhat in now. And it's characterized by random digit dial probability sampling and te telephone interviews. And so this transition from the first era to the second era, era was very contested. It took a lot of work to get this resolved. But eventually, we got it resolved because the advantages of this second era approach were really great. So now the second error approach is breaking down. So this is a, what discussed frequently in the social science community. Uh, I'm just basically going to assert that this is not going to work anymore. It's, it's, the long-term trends are very clear. And this is not just a problem that academics feel. Governments around the world have official statistics offices. All of them are running into this problem as well. So like the National Academy had a recent report about this. Like th this is a big problem in the world, not just our problem. Uh, so what is the third era of survey research going to look like? So this now we're sort of, we're kind of in the process of creating it now. And so this is sort of my speculation for what it will look like. Um, so first, sampling will become dominated by non-probability sampling. So this will be quite a big change that people find very frustrating. Also, interviews will no longer be administered by humans. We'll have much more computer-administered interviews. And then there's going to be a third characteristic that's different from the first two eras, which is the how surveys relate to other things in the data environment. So right now, most surveys are standalone things. But as the amount of data that exists in the world increases, much more you're going to see surveys linked to other sources of data. There are really big advantages to combining things. And by this linking, I don't just mean uh, like strict record linkage at the individual level. I would include things like Google Flu Trends in this. So Google Flu Trends takes the CDC influenza surveillance data and the Google search data to combine them in a way that produces estimates as properties that neither of these data sets has individually. So this is what I would propose as a problem. So creating this third era of survey research. So this is uh, something that uh, has many of the properties that we've discussed. I'll come back to it at the end. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about one specific aspect of this. I'm going to talk about this part of the third era of survey research, moving towards computer-administered interviews, which is, again, maybe the apparently least exciting aspect of this. So right, this seems kind of like, these two seem like very interesting kind of statistical challenges. And this actually is also a very interesting statistical and conceptual challenge. And that's what I'm going to talk about. OK, so most surveys now are, many surveys now are administered by a human. Someone calls you up, or someone comes to your house and asks you a bunch of questions. and. That is very expensive, and that also has certain limitations in terms of you have to, they can only happen when both people are in the same place or able to do it at the same time. So as we move towards computer administered interviews, costs will come down and flexibility will increase. So what this is going to do is it's going to enable us to do stuff that we haven't done before, which is great. So it's not just that we want to take what we've done before and put it on a computer is we want to also do new stuff that we couldn't do before. And then second, it's going to require certain changes. So surveys are a terrible user experience. Like people don't like filling out surveys. And it's going to get harder and harder to induce people to answer our surveys unless we make them a better experience. 
And so when there's a human administering the survey, there's something that's sort of keeping you engaged in the process. As that human disappears, we have to do different kinds of design to keep people involved and engaged. So it's going to require change, and it's going to enable change. And so what I'm going to tell you about now is a project I've done that uh, this is joint work with Karen Levy that was inspired by this website, uh, kittenwar.com. So if you go to Kitten War, this is what you will see. Please don't go to Kitten War now, because you won't hear anything else I say. Um, so you click on one of these kittens, and then another pair of kittens shows up, and you click again, and you click again, and again, and again. And before you know it, you spent 20 minutes clicking on kittens. Um, so in addition to being a fun way to spend time, there's something actually much deeper happening here. So if you click to see the winningest kittens, this is what you see. Pretty cute, I would say, in my opinion as a scientist. Those are pretty cute. Uh, and if you click to see the losingest kittens, this is what you see. Uh, very different. So let's go back here for one second. So what you've seen is that this very simple and enjoyable voting mechanism is able to detect this very real social signal. The other thing that's amazing about this to me is that all of these kittens were uploaded by users. So user-generated content is a very common thing on the web, but it's a very rare thing in surveys. Right? So one of the great things about this is that Kitten War is a system to find the cutest cat anywhere in the cat picture anywhere in the world, even if it's not something that I knew about ahead of time as a researcher, even if it's not in a book in the library. So in essence, Kitten War really solves a fundamental problem with social data collection. And that is, we underlying a lot of the ways we collect data, there's this tension between quantifiability and openness. So on the one hand, we have methods like surveys that are very good at quantifying large amounts of information, but surveys are fundamentally closed. So you write all the questions, and you write all the answers. So anyone who's ever written a survey before has this fear of like, oh, maybe I'm not asking the right question, or I haven't included the right answer choices. So they're very constrained in that it's very hard to learn something new, new in a survey. So for that, that's a very known problem. And for that reason, uh, social scientists also have methods like interviews, focus groups, and ethnography that are much more open to new information. But those methods struggle also because they're slow and expensive and hard to quantify. And so what this is about is trying to create a hybrid that combines the quantifiability of surveys with the openness of interviews. We call this wiki survey, sort of inspired by Wikipedia. So just like Wikipedia evolves over time based on user input, imagine if you had a survey that evolved over time based on user input. OK, so we thought, OK, let's try to think about what this would look like. And more generally, let's try to think about what would a survey that was really designed for a digital environment look like? So most of the, you've probably all been in web surveys. And I would argue that none of you have been in a real web survey. So what you've been in is a face-to-face -face survey that's put on the web. If you printed out the last SurveyMonkey survey that you were in, you could give that to an interviewer who would go door to door and just ask people questions. So what's happened is people have just transferred the way we've done things before into this new medium. And that's not really taking advantage of its opportunities. It's like if you have a radio soap opera, and then you put a TV camera in front of it, and then you say you have a TV soap opera. But you don't. You have a radio soap opera put on TV. And I think we have face-to-face -face surveys put on the web. So what would a real web survey look like? And so for this, we looked at a lot of online information aggregation systems, things like Wikipedia. And we tried to think about some general properties that they have. So if we sort of try to take all the ideas of survey research and all the ideas of Wikipedia and put them together, this is kind of what we came up with, these three general properties. So one is wiki surveys should be greedy. And what I mean by greedy is the following. They should collect as much or as little information as each person is willing to provide. And this differs fundamentally from the way surveys work now. So if you look at a lot of online systems, you'll see a property like this. So this is a rank order plot. So this here is the person. The x-axis is the contributors by rank. The y-axis is the amount that they contribute. So this is the person that contributes the most to Wikipedia. They contribute lots of information. 
and then there's a lot of people who contribute a little bit of information. So this is sometimes called the fat head and the long tail. And part of what makes Wikipedia magical is that it can harvest all of that information. So if you want to spend 80 hours a week contributing to Wikipedia, great. If you want to add a comma once a month, great. And that differs fundamentally from how social scientists usually collect their data. So in surveys, we collect a fixed amount of information per person. If someone comes to you and says, I love your survey, I want to do it 100 times, it's, so, it's funny because like, no one would do that because surveys are such an awful experience. But if people are really interested and want to help you more, we don't let them do that. And if someone comes to you and says, oh, uh, you're, what you're doing is OK, I'll give you one minute. We say, no, nope, you can't do that. That creates item non-response. So we're dropping off all these potential light contributors, too. So to put this back into the context of Wikipedia, if they allowed 10 and only 10 edits per person, they would lose about 95% of their edits. So there's enormous amounts of information in the fat head and the long tail that we want to capture in these wiki surveys. Second, we want them to be collaborative. So rather than the idea of a researcher creates the instrument, we want to have the participants also playing a role in creating the instrument. And this is going to be key for us actually learning new things. And then finally, we want the procedure to be adaptive. And so what I mean by adaptive is we want to use all the information that we have at any moment to only ask people the next question that's the most valuable for us. So if we took our participants' time seriously and treated it as a valuable resource, we would only want to ask them the most important questions. And the way surveys work right now is all the questions are fixed in advance. And you can't change them once you start. So by the time, and the order is fixed. So, but by the time, if you're going to do a thousand interviews, by the time you've done 500, you actually know much more than you knew at the beginning. That information is basically off limits in the way we do surveys now. So just one thing: collaborative and adaptive seem to be uh, similar, but I want to clarify: collaborative is about being open to new information, and adaptive is about using the information you have most effectively. Okay. So these are the general principles. And then we went ahead and built a system that satisfies these properties. So at the end of yesterday, we talked some about building systems. Michael Kearns and Kurt said, why don't social scientists build more systems? Uh, so here we built a system. And I can talk more about why I think more social scientists don't do this later. Um, so we got some funding from Google, and we built this website uh, called allourideas.org. Anyone in the world can come here and create their own wiki survey, which we host for them. And it's, everything is free and completely open source. Um, and so this has sort of, I think of this as having two sort of roles. One is we get to actually provide this service to everyone in the world for free, which I think is cool. And also, we have now a steady stream of traffic that we can use for future research. So it's a case where having an impact and doing your research are mutually reinforcing. So what does it actually look like? I'm going to give, tell you a little bit about an example that we did with Mayor Bloomberg's office in New York. So they wanted uh, to collect public input on Plan YC 2030. This was the city's long-term sustainability plan. So in addition to other forms of community outreach, they also created a wiki survey. So right now, these wiki surveys allow for a single question. So this is the question that they picked, which do you think is a better idea for creating a greener, greater New York? And then you start it off with a bunch of different seed ideas. These are things like require buildings to make energy efficiency upgrades and so on. All these seed ideas are limited to, all the ideas in the system are limited to be 140 characters to try to improve the user experience. Like we don't want big manifestos about the nature of city governance or something. Um, so then they dump all this into our website, and we create a wiki survey for them, which has its own URL. So it's allourideas.org slash planyc. This is the experience of a user. They come, and they see two ideas. Uh, that then they click on the one that they like better. A new pair appears. And this process continues again and again. Critically, at any time, anyone can add their own idea, which goes into the system. The moderator can then approve that idea then it will appear to future voters. So the role of moderation here is not to shut off uh, conflicting ideas, but to exclude like, things like profanity and so on that the mayor's office did not want in there. Um, also, at any time, people can view the results. 
<coughs> so they can see which of the um, ideas are, are the most popular. So they are scored on a score from 0 to 100. And I'm going to tell you now about what that score is, how we do it. OK. So that's kind of the motivation and the user experience. Yeah? Did the uh, idea that some user added show, was it shown to another user? Uh, Absolutely, yeah. So once an idea gets uploaded, assuming it gets accepted by the moderator, and most of them are, then it goes into the pool that we choose from when we present to future users. And one question that comes up a lot is, how do you choose the pairs? Uh, so for now, what we're doing is something quite simple. It's essentially random. It's a little more complicated than that, but for now, you can assume that it's random. And one of the things that is part of the design of this system is that can improve over time. Like As we get better and better at how to choose the pairs, there's a, a lot of statistical questions about that. We can drop that algorithm in the back end, and this can continue to improve over time, as with the scoring system. Again, the users don't really need to know or care exactly how we calculate the score. As we get better and better at doing that, we can drop that algorithm in the back end as well. So it's a system that's sort of set up for continual improvement as we learn more. Yep? So you basically are able to manipulate so that the choice between two choices uh, could be better estimated if that wasn't offered previously by a random choice. You can augment the probability for a specific Exactly, exactly. So we completely control the system. So one of the huge advantages of this approach, rather than working with companies where you have to convince some project manager what to do, here we completely control this. Anything that we want to do, we can do. We don't need to worry about shareholders or any. It's like our system. And so that, create, that means that it's a really an ideal test bed for research if we can have users that we can do whatever we want. Um, yeah. OK, so this is the data that we have. So the data, their votes, they're nested within sessions. So a session you can think of roughly as a person, but we don't have any authentication system. So one person could create multiple sessions. That's what I'm going to call them, sessions. You see two items, and then you see the item that the person has chosen. Yeah? So uh, we have the IP address. We actually don't store that. So what we do is we geolocate that, and then we store a hash of that. Um, so this gets into some of the ethical privacy challenges. And I also have a new appreciation of some of those. Having had to try to design a system, um, it can be hard to be transparent to the users about exactly what's happening. But yeah, so we do not store IP addresses. OK, so this is the data that we have, this sequence of votes that are nested within sessions. Then this is the target of inference. So this is a matrix where each row is a session, and each column is an idea. And so roughly, we want to know how much everyone likes everything. So if we could estimate this, we would know a lot about, let's say, the opinions of people in New York, so, or at least the people who participated in our wiki survey. So for example, theta 1, 1 might be how much the person in session 1 likes the idea of free bike racks in Manhattan. And theta 1, 2 might be how much person 1 likes the idea of more bus service to the outer boroughs, and so on. So this is what we want to estimate. How we're going to actually estimate this, we're going to assume a statistical model. So we're going to make some, this is similar to what Susan was talking about a little bit. We're going to create, make some assumptions about how people vote given their preferences. And then we're going to make some other assumptions about the patterns of preferences in the population. And then we're going to do Bayesian inference. So I'm going to skip through the modeling assumptions for now, but they're all in the paper. So in the end, you get some posterior distribution, and you take draws from this posterior distribution. And then, yep. Uh, I know we're supposed to hold questions, but I mean, at some point, there will be strategic behavior, right? Like bikers want more things for bikers. So. If, if these are consequential, they'll get yeah. So this is a good question. So one of the things about strategic behavior is that this system is much less susceptible to it than you might think. So a lot, so a lot of existing systems, they allow you to choose which things you vote on. So if you look at a lot of online polling systems, you, you like see a list of ideas. You can go there and upvote them. So that is very susceptible to strategic behavior. So for example, 
President Obama used something called Google Moderator, which is essentially one of these upvoting systems, to try to find the ideas that were most important to Americans. And across a wide variety of categories, they were all related to the legalization of marijuana. And so President Obama was a little embarrassed that he, because he had pre-committed to answering the questions that come out of the system, and then he had all these questions about marijuana in the middle of like the financial crisis. Um, and so the problem was that, yeah, as you can, everyone can know, like the uh, marijuana advocacy organization said, everyone go here and vote for the marijuana thing. One difference here is that with pairwise comparisons, we choose which prompts people vote on. So if you are, uh, let's say your idea is to legalize marijuana in New York, you come here, you have to vote for a long time before that even becomes a possibility. So by us choosing the pairs, we get a lot of statistical advantages because we can choose pairs that are most informative to us. And we also get some protection against this gaming because you can't come here just looking for marijuana things. You have to cast a lot of other roads. So you could say, oh, you can come here and you can just vote randomly until you get to the marijuana thing. And that would be detectable. Like we have a whole sequence of votes and we can see, oh, this session seems to be voting very differently than all the other sessions. And then we can potentially take that session out of the results. Um, OK, so we, we've, it's a good gaming is a big problem with a lot of these systems. So now we've done all this modeling. We have this matrix that allows us to make uh, all these estimates. Now we have a second problem, which is that this is, pr this is pretty much uninterpretable. This is huge. It's like uh, thousands of users by hundreds of ideas. It's just a bunch of numbers that are measured on this probit scale, which I haven't talked about. So you can't just like dump this on the mayor's desk. So then we do a second step. We're on the user's screens. So then we do the second step where we reduce this big matrix into a one-dimensional vector of scores. And the score is the estimated probability that item K beats a randomly chosen item for a randomly chosen session. So a lot of information gets lost when you take this big matrix and you reduce it to this kind of vector. It's all this errors and possibility and so on. But I'm just going to do it anyway, because we need something that's clear and interpretable that we can present to users. The other thing that may seem strange about this is why estimate this whole big matrix if all you're going to do is, if all you care about is these scores, right? Like It's much easier to estimate the scores than it is to estimate this whole matrix. Um, but the idea is that the, the estimating this entire matrix, one, provides a more natural way for us to extend the model. So right now, we're not using information about the users. We're not using information about the ideas. You want to extend those in this way. And then also, there's lots of other things that we might want to spit out of this. There's lots of other summary statistics of this big matrix. So if we can estimate this, we don't just get this. We get lots of other things, too which we don't have yet, but what we could have in the future. OK? So let's see how this actually works in practice. So remember, it was part of the city's sustainability plan. They have one question, a bunch of seed ideas. They recruited people by outreach through social media. So this is an example of one of their tweets. So this is not a random sample of people who participated in this. Uh, I am very aware of that. and. Um, but there's nothing that prevents using wiki surveys with random samples. So again, it's important to separate out the interview process from the sampling process. OK. So they recruited a bunch of people through social media. What actually happened in terms of the participation? So this, you can think back to that cartoon I had earlier from Wikipedia. So this is a rank order plot of the sessions. This is the number of responses. And so one person, for example, contributed 800 responses. Lots of people contributed a very small number of responses. So we designed the system to be able to be greedy. And it was able to do that. People wanted to participate differentially. This also applies for the ideas that are contributed by users. Again, you see a very similar shape. Uh, most users contribute, who contribute actually only contribute one idea. But some users contribute multiple ideas. Uh, so we had about 30,000 responses and about 450 ideas uploaded. So now the results. So the x-axis here is the score. And remember, that goes from 0 to 100. Higher scores are better. Uh, 
all of the ideas that are in blue were uploaded by users. So eight of the top 10 ideas were uploaded by users. So this really, to me, shows the value of being open, right? If the cities had all the best ideas at the beginning, there's no need to do something that's open. But the fact that ideas that were uploaded by users scored better shows that there is, a, if it wasn't for this, this whole thing would be kind of not, not necessarily worth all the effort. But the fact that these ideas are uploaded and score well shows that there is something to be learned from this process. So this is something we saw over and over again, that ideas uploaded by users scored better than the best initial ideas, and we wanted to understand why. Why was that happening? So one of the things we did is we did interviews with the wiki survey creators, and we asked them, like, what are these things that get uploaded and score well? Why didn't you think of them before? Uh, and so we found that generally there are two main categories of uploaded ideas that score well. So one is what we call alternative framings. So these are ideas that the creator already had, but they're expressed differently by the users. So an example of this is the top scoring uploaded idea, keep NYC's drinking water clean by banning fracking in NYC's watershed. So when we talked to the people in the mayor's office, we said, you know, didn't you guys know about fracking? And they said, of course we know about fracking, but we talk about it differently. We say protect the watershed, not protect the watershed from fracking. And so, but clearly this is a much more resonant way of expressing it. And I think this is a general property in the way researchers design surveys. So like, if I have a survey and I make an answer to my survey, social structure. So to me, social structure is like a deep concept with many, you know, a, a, 100 year history of books and that's like an entire question on someone's general exam in sociology is like what is social structure so like to me that means a lot of things to the average user it doesn't it doesn't have that same connotation and so it shouldn't be surprising to us that the way that we express our ideas as people who have thought about this problem for a long time might not resonate with our respondents who haven't thought about it in the same way so the second uh, broad category of uploaded ideas that score well is novel information. So this is stuff that's actually new and unanticipated to the users. So one example of this, plug ships into the electrical grid so they don't idle in port, reducing emissions equivalent to 12,000 cars per ship. So this is pretty interesting. So you might wonder if this is even true. Uh, and that was something that the mayor's office wondered. Uh, and so it turns out that it's more like 5,000 cars per ship. So they, after you know, this idea sort of bubbled up, they investigated it, and this turned out to be something that was very interesting to them. So I'm going to I have a, here a little heuristic argument for why this is always going to happen. So if you do a wiki survey, I will bet you a beer or whatever people like to drink in Berkeley that the uploaded ideas will score better than the best initial ideas. And I'm going to briefly go through this. So these are the seed ideas from New York. These are the uploaded ideas. So the y-axis here is the score. So there's two things that pop out at you. One, there are many, many more uploaded ideas than there are initial ideas. And the second is that the variance of the uploaded ideas is much higher. So if your intuition is these uploaded ideas are going to be garbage, you're right, there's a lot of garbage here. But it's high variance. There are some good things there as well. And so generally, if you're looking for extreme outcomes, variance plus volume is good. So usually we think of variance as being a bad thing, something we want to remove. But if you care about finding the best ideas, you want to be open to a high variance, high volume data source. OK, so we're currently hosting about 8,000 wiki surveys with about 11 million votes in total. It's been used some by government. So this is the uh, project by the Brazilian House of Representatives. This is the UN, some social movements like Occupy Wall Street and Wikipedia, and then some companies as well. So taking a step back and moving more towards the theme of this conference and sort of what social science can do in the future. So I think a lot of social science projects are very hard. It's a lot of work. You do a lot of work. You push the rock up the mountain, you get to the mountain, you get up to the top, and then it's done, and then you got to start pushing the next rock up the mountain. And that's too hard. So what I wanted to try to do was create a research project that created some, a virtuous cycle so that once things, you push the rock up the mountain, then it just sort of starts to roll on its own. 
Uh, and so you can see how the website can potentially do that. So we have users of the website. They help us do research. Research helps the website get better. That attracts more users. And you can get this virtuous cycle. Uh, and then we want to accelerate this virtuous cycle by openness. So all the code is open source. Uh, we make it very easy for you to take out your data from the website so that you could take it and run. Because we only do a small set of analysis on the website. You may have other ideas for what you want to do. Take your data out and do it. That's awesome. If what you do is cool and you think other people would like it, send it to us and we can build that into the site for everyone. Um, so trying to increase the impact through openness. Uh, so just wrapping up, you know, the second era of survey research is basically falling apart. Everyone knows this. A lot of the move towards the third era of survey research is driven by fear about the end of this second era. People are like, oh, I guess we have to figure out this third era. But what I hope I've showed you today with the Wiki Surveys project is that there's also reason to be excited about making this transition. That is, it's not just that we should create this third era because we have to. It's also a great opportunity for us to do stuff that we couldn't have done before. Right? So this is a really exciting time, and this is a really big problem, not just for academics, but for the world. And so in the white paper that we worked on, we talked about sort of three criteria that these Goldilocks problems should have. So problem-driven research, so I think there is a real problem here. Practical impact, I think there is a practical impact. And I think that social scientists often think of their impact as happening through policymakers, like let's advise policymakers about what they should do. But we can also have a practical impact by building things that are really useful for people. And that was not something that we could do before because we did not have these zero marginal cost systems. So like the Survey Research Center at Berkeley, there used to be a Survey Research Center here that helped people do surveys. They could only help people who worked at Berkeley because it was expensive, because there's people doing stuff. And it eventually actually got shut down because of funding constraints. But now, with this wiki surveys, the marginal cost of another person doing it is basically zero. So we can, everyone in the world can use it. Um, obviously, we don't do everything that the Survey Research Center used to do, but we can imagine doing that. And then finally, a commitment to openness. So thank you. <laughs>